Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Doorstep Podcast. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Vosdev. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also Senior Fellow here at Carnegie, welcoming in a moment Suzanne Nossel, who is currently the Chief Executive Officer of PEN America, the leading human rights and free expression organization and author of Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All. She's joining us to speak about narratives, Nick, and ahead of tonight's uh, address to the nation uh, from President Biden. What narratives are you looking for? The challenge the president will face tonight is that he has had competing narratives over the last three years about what he thinks the role of the U.S. is in the world, what type of America he wants to see emerge. And it is tying those narratives together that is proving to be the challenge, uh, where we've gone from foreign policy for the middle class, to climate as the existential challenge that uh, the U.S. and the nations of the world must face, back to traditional geopolitics. Then the question is uh, Russia or China as the proximate threat, back to uh, rejuvenating uh, the sources of American democracy and rejuvenating the American economy. So the challenge he has in a state of the union is putting all of that back together into a coherent narrative. The problem is that states of the union addresses often become laundry lists, either of set policy achievements, or here's my checklist of things that I'd like to see happen and the laws I want Congress to pass. And there may not be uh, a single narrative. And as we're seeing, the White House staff is having difficulties sometimes in putting all of these things into one single coherent package. Let's go to Suzanne now. Thank you so much for joining us today, Suzanne. Uh, on a pivotal day, uh, we have many things happening. Um, Biden is speaking tonight. Um, we have uh, International Women's Day tomorrow. So many things to talk about. But I want to start off with, because what really drew me to you and to have you here is your recent piece um, in Foreign Affairs um, magazine on uh, the real culture wars and your discussion uh, that culture creators are part of the infantry of anti-authoritarianism. And I think talking about this is so important. The role that you say, and you write, that culture is not a sideshow to geopolitics, but rather a central arena with sweeping implications for international relations. Um, I think we don't often talk about this, especially in the news cycle today when everything is about guns, guns, guns. Um, and so I wonder if you can um, walk us through your thoughts uh, when you were writing this article um, and the main point um, of it, you know, as expressed uh, in Foreign Affairs. Yeah, sure. You know, I'd say this idea was sparked by the work that we do at PEN America with our partners at PEN Ukraine. Uh, we had worked over years to build up a pen organization in Ukraine. And when the war started, it was just extraordinary to see how they activated. Uh, they have been delivering books across the country, programming literary events and festivals, supporting writers, including writers who are on the front lines, who are still managing to publish, uh, trying to sustain the publishing industry in Ukraine, which is beleaguered now, traveling internationally to get Ukrainian voices onto a global stage, making the case for the war effort and the survival of Ukraine as an independent nation kind of from the perspective of authors and thinkers. And it's just been so powerful to witness that it really got me thinking about the role of culture in pushback against authoritarianism. And of course, I well knew that from the authoritarian perspective, uh, you know, this has become a, a central tool. If we look at what Xi Jinping is doing globally, whether it's the Confucius Institutes on U.S. campuses or you know, for a time really trying to influence Hollywood filmmaking and the portrayal of China in that context uh, work to influence the media diet of Chinese diaspora communities across the country. So many different multi-pronged efforts to burnish China's image, to control the narrative, to suppress cultural influences that are regarded as hostile. And you see similar patterns in Russia. And so 
you know, the question I wanted to ask is clearly the authoritarians realize that culture is a central battleground, but, you know, have our democracies uh, sort of missing out on this part of the picture? I completely agree with you. Uh, I'm taking it from extending your analysis to the news and news diets of you know the younger generation. Um, you know, I teach uh, aspiring journalists, and it is interesting to see where they get their news, and is all through a cultural context, uh, whether it be celebrities or fashion designers or you know books. Right? They're they're getting their first point of contact with the world and the globe happens to be through culture and not through, you know, traditional, um, you know, news media, you know, they may come to them second. And so the narratives are really coming through culture. Um, and, and people aren't really talking about that, right? Uh, everything is still uh, very much thought of as, well, we're going to, you know, control it from the top down. Um, but yet all of this is really bubbling up from the bottom up with what people are you know, trying to read or, affin you know, something that they're affi affiliated with. Um, and I wonder what can we do, right, um, to, to elevate this conversation? Yeah, look, I think that's right. I mean, something I've thought of is, you know, this kind of yawning and growing democratic deficit and the fact that Freedom House's indicators seem to be on a steady decline. And you know, why are we falling short in our efforts to shore up democracies, uh, faltering democracies, to push back against authoritarianism? And I think you know, there's so much emphasis on institutions. There's a lot of emphasis on voting and elections. And all that is extremely important. But I also think that you know, it goes deeper. It's you know, What's clear is those efforts are not sufficient and that if you can't plug in at the level of culture what is influencing people how their values are being shaped what their perceptions are of their own government of foreign governments uh what they value what they believe is indigenously theirs we have what freedom represents what their exposure is to the possibility of freedom of expression uh creative freedom you know, all of that, I think, ultimately, in terms of really making the case for what it means to live in a free society and why it's appealing, I think, you know, we are going to have to plumb to these deeper levels. And I think it's going to be cultural forces rather than kind of straight up argumentation or news or policy pronouncements that allow us to do that. That really gets me thinking, Suzanne, about you know, the role that culture plays and cultural products, cultural exports. And if we're moving back into thinking of culture as uh, part of this struggle between democracy and authoritarianism, you know, during the Cold War, uh, Western culture went hand in hand, that, that people behind the Iron Curtain maybe didn't read de Tocqueville, didn't read John Locke, but they were anxious for the Western cultural exports uh, from fashion to music to everything else. Uh, do you still see that with sort of, you know, the leading, particularly American cultural exporters around the world? Are they making that link that the cultural products that they're producing, and I'm thinking of singers and artists and others, that the, the product that, they're, uh, that they are dispensing is intrinsically linked to being and living in a free and open society? And conversely, are you seeing any authoritarian cultural exports that you see are resonating, say, in the United States, where, uh, you know, it, 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 that there are, whether it's musicians or film or other cultural exports, video gaming or things like that, where uh, from an authoritarian side, it's influencing, you know, young Americans, young Europeans, young Latin Americans and the like? Yeah, look, I think. Yeah, you know, what happened during the Cold War was there, you know, there was this heavy emphasis, and I talk about it in the piece, uh, on sort of the export of American and Western culture and the notion that culture was a battleground and a deep engagement with all kinds of artistic institutions, uh, literary and scholarly 
magazines, even an organization like Penn, there was a relationship uh, with the CIA uh, in, in the 1960s uh, that we uncovered uh, as part of, I, mean, I don't think it was such a secret, but when we did some archival research for our centenary to discover that the CIA was enmeshed in, you know, and it wasn't just us, the Paris Review, all of these different institutions. And, you know, there was kind of awakening to the, both the danger and the hypocrisy of that, the idea that these institutions were being discredited and the notion that kind of this heavy hand of government, government uh, playing a role in shaping those cultural in institutions, organizations, and narratives uh, ran counter to the liberal premise of sort of let a thousand flowers bloom culturally. And that culture is an arena for openness, uh, that people can test boundaries, that there's no imposed monoculture coming from above. And so there was a real turnabout uh, and a recognition that these tactics suddenly look very heavy handed. Some of them were shadowy and uh, hard to see who was really behind, you know, what might come across as an authentic initiative, but perhaps was not. And so I think what that led to was a kind of a, a dialing back of the approach where it became sort of softer and gentler and, uh, you know, less targeted, more academic exchanges touring and traveling artists, musicians uh, around the world just to kind of build goodwill. But, you know, without this express purpose of pushing back against other forces. And you know, I think today, look, there's plenty of American and Western cultural influence globally. And, you know, particularly because our technology companies are so dominant, you know, the, the moderation of social media, you know, remains to a very large extent sort of dictated in Silicon Valley. And that's changing a bit now with the adoption of new rules in Europe that exert a heavier hand over that. But there's plenty of American cultural influence, uh, also in television and entertainment in music. Uh, and I don't think that most cultural producers sort of see themselves as, you know, playing a role of being a purveyor of American ideals. I think that's kind of discredited. It seems uh, intrusive. You know, there's much more recognition that people around the world, you know, need to arrive at their own ideas. And the, in the piece, what I emphasize is not a return to what I see as sort of an outdated approach of pushing, if you will, American or Western culture internationally, but rather looking at indigenous, authentic cultural voices and forces like a Penn Ukraine. Uh, and I give other examples in the piece, you know, that can be elevated and supported and protected uh, to demonstrate in, you know, a very natural, organic, and I think persuasive way that having these independent, uh, entities, creators in a society, allowing them to do their work, uh, hearing what they have to say, letting them test the boundaries, that, that that in itself, I think, is a powerful antidote to authoritarianism. Uh, you mentioned a couple of other things in your piece, um, such as shoring up some UN efforts uh, to support um, artist exchanges. Um, in the model of you write um, what you know the UN Human Rights Council does for human rights defenders, um, in an, in a time where the UN is not looking so great, um, you know how can we pivot and and give them a bigger voice uh, in some of this work? Yeah, I mean that's something we've thought about for a while because of our work at Pen America with writers and artists that they are not a category of people recognized as deserving of special protection in a human rights context. You have special protections that have been extended to human rights defenders, as you mentioned, but also to journalists, recognizing the crucial role of a, pre, a free press as an underpinning of free societies, of democracy, of a rights-respecting environment. And you know, it's our view that writers, scholars, artists uh, play a similar role, that they are kind of the vessels for that freedom and that they're, they are deserving of similar kinds of protections uh, through the system that these other categories already receive. And we're working now in the UN system to try to bring about that 
recognition and enshrinement, international norms that would afford artists and writers greater protection. And I think it's one of the areas, look, the UN is always uh, a, a kind of bone of contestation uh, and, and has, you know, in, in my whole career, I think been considered in many ways a flawed institution, but it is variegated. There's a lot to it. And I always have had the view we ought to take advantage of, you know, that which is useful and try to strengthen the elements that can uh, make a positive difference. And when it comes to these normative elements, We've seen, you know, for journalists, it really does make a difference. It gets international uh, institutions more involved. There's so much more discussion of press freedom and journalism now than there used to be as far as what protections journalists need, holding governments accountable when they infringe on the rights of journalists, looking at, you know, the angle of the effect of journal on journalists in a conflict like Ukraine or right now Israel-Gaza. So it, it sort of puts, it trains the spotlight. I think the UN normative mechanisms are part of how that happens. And then there are just very practical things, networks, funding support uh, that come through the recognition of these categories where it, it becomes easier for individuals to access you know, the forms of support that they need to continue to carry out their work. And then there's also a civil society dimension where organizations sort of grow up uh, to uh, buttress and bolster, you know, those who are seen as worthy of protection. And so it, it has a way of sort of driving forward recognition of a particular category. And I think it's, it's very well-deserved and overdue when it comes to culture makers. Um, one of the other recommendations you have is that U.S. embassies abroad and USAID work work along these same lines. And um, it's so interesting because I think, you know, in general, I think, you know, if Americans think of embassies, they don't, <laughs> if they think of them, they think of them as places where you get a visa stamp, right? They don't think of them traditionally, you know, which is part of their role, right, as cultural influencers. Um, and so I wonder, you know, what you're seeing now, because there's been, you know, some tumult in the State Department over the last five years and embassy, you know, ambassadorships not being filled. And I wonder, you know, is that still an area of opportunity with some of the tumult and now uncertainty with the election? Yeah, I mean, it's a fair question. I think uh, there was a lot of damage done to the State Department and the diplomatic corps as an institution. And the process of undoing that damage, I think has turned out to be more difficult and protracted than anyone maybe expected. And it's still very much underway. But nonetheless, you do see I mean, embassies are engaged in culture. You know, at the simplest level, they underwrite bringing US cultural figures uh, around the world to participate in events and kind of bring a U.S. voice and perspective. And so they all have cultural attaches. That's a whole system that exists. And so I think we can be taking advantage of it. And I think recognizing that local cultural figures are, you know, and I think the best ambassadors honestly know this. They build relationships with influentials in the society from all kinds of different angles, uh, recognizing, you know, the complexity and that it's not just about engaging with diplomatic counterparts. But I think it is something that, again, can be more of a point of emphasis. And that's, you know, what, one of my motivations in, in writing the piece was just to sort of connect these dots and uh, hopefully elevate the attention being afforded to these relationships and to these influencers within societies. Can I ask, uh, building on that and this notion of supporting networks, and as you said, embassies support cultural uh, activities, uh, but the question of, of, of who pays, uh, who comes up with the resources? Because someone might say, you know, Taylor Swift does a pretty good job of both mobilizing interest in foreign affairs among her fan base in the United States. Uh, she's a cultural phenomenon uh, that, you know, countries bid now for, hey, we wanted to be part of the ERAs tour. Uh, and how then do we deal with those who say, well, just let the market handle it, right? The market will uh, send out its demand signals. Cultural uh, 
uh, uh, cultural creators and influencers will respond to market signals and, and so on and so forth. I mean, bringing it back to, you know, what is the, the, the sort of the U.S. interest as a society for doing this rather than just ceding it to the market, which arguably we've been doing now for at least several decades of just letting the market handle uh, cultural transmission. Where do you yeah. see the role of conscious, consciously embracing this uh, coming in. Yeah, I mean, I'm not advocating, I don't talk in the piece about investing in the promotion of American cultural icons or products globally. Uh, I think the market does take care of that. The, the, uh, the money, the amount of money that is involved in the financial incentives are ones that, you know, at a governmental level, we should not be trying to compete with. What I talk about in the piece is a role in engaging with and supporting local cultural voices, uh, creators, thinkers, people who emblemize in the eyes of populations kind of on the front lines of these authoritarian struggles, uh, the idea of independence of thought, uh, the idea of bravery, challenging conventional wisdom or authority, uh, visions for new and different futures that the government may not want you to see, but could be reflected in a piece of theater or a novel. And, you know, what I say is that we have to be very kind of thoughtful, deliberate and specific in how we would support that kind of activity. There are contexts like, you know, China, where any kind of Western hand in supporting culture has become kind of difficult to impossible and it discredits and probably imperils anyone who might be on the receiving end. In a place like Ukraine though, where the West is providing enormous military support, you know, for a, 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 a minuscule fraction of that, you could do more to underwrite the cultural sector, to enable publishers to continue putting out books to bring Ukrainian writers around the world so that they have a, a, a chance to engage on an international stage and kind of convey their narrative. So there are things you can do uh, that are really inexpensive relative to virtually any other form of diplomacy or geopolitical influence making uh, that you can do with culture that are not about promoting, again, a Western or an American product, but rather elevating individuals. And I think you also, importantly, and I say this in the piece, it can't be about dictating, you know, what they're going to paint, uh, you know, what is the show that they're going to put on, uh, you know, what is their music, what are the themes, what are the lyrics? Uh, you know, the whole point is to underscore the idea that, you know, freedom is powerful, that these people are also connected to cultural traditions that mean something to the populations where they're from that are uh, kind of deeply resonant and have an authenticity and that, uh, you know, simply exemplifying the fact that an open culture with all kinds of different creators and voices and products and ideas flowing, that there is power in that. And I think that the, in terms of the the power of sharing that, um, I think tech companies, you, which you alluded to uh, earlier in the conversation are, are an important part um, you know, I had an exchange student just uh, a couple months ago, and we were able to connect over Netflix shows. I mean, you know, over, you know, books, right? The, you know, we went to Barnes and Noble and the book she had wanted from Brazil was here. And, and it was so fascinating to see that there's this globalization of culture that also I think maybe isn't as recognized, you know, that, that people are sharing information, you know, despite the efforts of, of some tech companies to tamp down information on their platforms with their algorithms, right? The information sharing is hap happening globally. And I wonder if instead of vilifying tech companies, and I know there's a new effort in Congress to kind of regulate them, um, just happening today, a vote, um, if there's some way to kind of push more of this global connection, and, and I don't know, just thinking off the top of my head, but I'm wondering if you've seen any of that work with tech companies in, in terms of doing more cross-cultural communication, um, you know, and, and I mean, I'll throw this in as an aside, but, but how will AI affect that? Yeah, look, I think they are vehicles for 
cultural projection and that sophisticated uh, creators all over the world in so many different realms are on social media and they're finding audiences and they're not geographically bounded. So people are able to connect across difference. And I think, you know, they're in this universe, you touch on AI where we're increasingly flooded with disinformation. And if you look down your feed on Twitter slash X, it really is becoming increasingly difficult to know what to believe, whether it's something that's been completely falsified or just a, a kind of tendentious narrative that's coming from an angle where you may not know the motives behind what is being said or written. I think in that context as well, that art and literature take on additional significance because they get at the truth in a different way and in a way that is becoming, I think, ever more elusive in our information ecosystem. So if you want to understand what's happening in the Middle East, you might be better off reading a novel or a work of history than you are trying to wade through your Twitter feed, trying to make sense of it. Um, speaking of reading books, um, I do want to mention some of your efforts against uh, the book bans happening here in the U.S. and what more we should be doing to talk about that. Yeah, look, I mean, there are authoritarian impulses at work in our own country, which I've been really surprised to see. I mean, as an American, to see a surge in book bans, we've documented more than 6,000 book bans over the last couple of years. I find really startling. And you know, we see increasingly a few courts, even conservative courts, uh, you know, waking up to this and saying this runs counter to the First Amendment. And it's part of a culture war, a sense in some communities or by some individuals that things are cultural change is moving too quickly. We're embracing different narratives and identities. So it really kind of comes to this uh, very fundamental issue that is at work around the globe of who controls the story. Is there a single story that's being told and taught or are there multiple stories? And, you know, how do we sustain an open educational environment where people can be exposed to a wide variety of ideas and sort through them so that there is no wisdom kind of being dictated from on high? I mean, we should be teaching critical thinking skills. So, we're working all over the country. We've been kind of the primary organization documenting, naming, quantifying the problem of book bans. And now we're working with communities across the country and in the courts to push back. And you know, the heartening thing is most Americans do not like book bans. This is not something that uh, you know people associate with a country that has the world's highest standard for protection of freedom of speech in the world. And so awakening people to what is happening and how they can push back has been very powerful. And I, I see we're all, we all have books behind us. So <laughs> we're all um, in this together. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Um, and I encourage um, everyone to go out and find the real culture wars uh, and, and read more about uh, Pan America's work. And I really appreciate you being with us here today. Thanks so much for having me.